Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Liam Jia. I work for the EU SME Center uh, in China. Uh, we are the host of uh, today's uh, seminar and webinar. Um, and before we start, uh, I can be um, remind you that uh, this session is also online. Uh, for our online participants, if you would like to post your questions uh, to us, you are welcome to um, send them uh, online through the Q&A. Uh, first, allow me to make a small introduction about the EU um, SME Center. Um, we are a European founded project uh, since 2010, helping European SMEs uh, on uh, exporting uh, to China to get them ready for doing business in China. Uh, currently, we are in our third phase of the project, um, and the project is implemented by five uh, implementing partners, including today's uh, co and main organizer. Um, the Danish Chamber of uh, Commerce uh, in China, the TCCC, um, and also our uh, partner China Europe Water Platform. A little bit of uh, our services, uh, we have a knowledge center where we have published nearly 200 uh, comprehensive market reports and headlines and case studies. We have an advice center where we provide free of charge inquiry services to European uh, SMEs. And we also have a training center uh, that we provide uh, with our in-house and external experts, face-to-face um, -face and also online trainings um, to European uh, SMEs on uh, different uh, topics in different sectors. We also have a SME advocacy platform where we constantly voice on behalf of European SMEs to improve the business environment uh, of European businesses in China. Um, in May, uh, from March to May 2021, uh, together with uh, China Europe uh, Water Platform, uh, the SME Center, we have been organizing uh, four webinars um, on different uh, topics related to the water sector, includes blue green small cities, includes efficiency of uh, water infrastructure, um, digitalization in the water sector, which we have just discussed about in the session uh, before. Uh, and also lastly, we have discussed on carbon footprint of the water. We are happy to share with you that with all the seminars and uh, with all the webinars we organized, we have had uh, over 300 participants online um, that are from um, to uh, 20 European countries and also includes uh, participation from Chinese uh, uh, institutions. Um, yes, as I have just uh, introduced, uh, this seminar is organized in collaboration with the Danish Chamber of Commerce. Um, which is a non-profit uh, organization established by, um, in the first place, a group of Danish businessmen already in 1995, with a strong support of the Danish embassy in Beijing. Uh, and DCCC has uh, eventually officially registered themselves with the Ministry of Civil Affairs uh, in 2020. Um, DCCC also has three chapters in China, one uh, in the north, uh, based in Beijing, and there's also uh, two other chapters from uh, South China and the east um, parts of, uh, of the country. And currently there's uh, um, over 170 plus member companies uh, of uh, the DCCC covering almost all sectors. Um, and since uh, phase three of uh, the USB center, uh, the Data Center of Commerce has been a, uh, one of the implementing partners of uh, the consortium. Uh, and this is also the main platform for uh, Danish business uh, communities in China. Um, and we have also one of the DCCC members, uh, member company Nordic, uh, who is uh, our main speaker of uh, today, uh, which I will introduce uh, very shortly. 
Um, and you're also uh, welcome to learn more about DCCC through uh, the websites, the WeChat, um, the LinkedIn page, uh, and other official uh, communication channels. On today's um, topic, uh, I would first like to start uh, with presenting the observations um, and uh, findings from the past four uh, webinars that we have uh, organized, uh, particularly focusing on uh, circular uh, economy. The circular economy um, has become a prominent um, uh, point of discussion in both European and Chinese uh, policy making. And however, in uh, uh, Chinese and European perspective on circular economy, share some similarities and they share a common conceptual basis um, that exhibits um, some similar concerns in seeking to enhance uh, resource uh, efficiency. However, in practice, there are also uh, differences. Uh, for example, the Chinese perspective of circular economy is much broader. That also includes uh, uh, pollution and other issues alongside uh, water and resource concerns. And it's also framed as a response to the environmental challenges created by the rapid growth uh, and industrialization in China. And in contrast, uh, Europe's conception of circular economy has a much narrower um, environmental uh, scope, uh, which focuses more specifically on um, waste, uh, resources, uh, and opportunities for businesses uh, eventually. Um, so here I have listed some of uh, the main findings um, from the uh, seminar, from the webinars that we have organized, um, but I believe um, this will also be uh, covered mostly by um, our speaker. So I will uh, not spend too much time on this. Uh, instead, I will already introduce our speaker for uh, today, uh, Ms. Jingjing Ma the general manager of Nordic Group uh, in China. Um, and uh, later on, we will also have one uh, case sharing from uh, Donut uh, Dini from Arbia, um, followed by a Q&A and panel discussions. I think it's occasion to remind our online participants, uh, should you have any questions, uh, please uh, post uh, on the chat. Um, and last but not least, uh, I would also like to mention that uh, IPR protection in the circular economy for the operators, for businesses, is also uh, a very important um, thing to consider. And today we also have uh, Mr. Matthias Subimendi, the IP advice, advisor of the China IPSME help desk with us, who will also have uh, uh, share his insights on uh, IP protection uh, in circular economy. And without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, our first uh, speaker, Ms. Jing uh, Jing Ma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liam. Um, I think I will speak Chinese uh, as I'm presenting in the Aquatec. Thank you very much for the USMD. Thank you very much for the USMD. WP 邀请我们诺丽参与的十五届的上海国际推展那我本人的话我是在二零一七年参加幸运的参与了中国的第一个创意交易的方法学的编制那我本人也是专业的经理在这个可执行人事规划方面那么我个人也在这个规划和这个污水厂的这个村镇污水的方面有过落地
是因为我们是二零一五年在这个中国成立的丹麦的公司，那么我们有主要是有三个业务，一块是在这个读书文化和设计，一块是在这个建筑设计，那么我们还有一块业务是在这个零碳的技术咨询方面。分五个章节啊，我会先介绍一下这个在一个二零六零方面，综合政策下的一个绿色转型的方法。第二个，我会呃分享一下，在我们研究了在过去十年中国在污水行业的碳足迹的一些。那我会介绍一下我们中国现在目前执政的这个污水处理呃方面的这个权利。是，也是结合这个现在的这个新冠疫情之后的一个绿色复苏，啊，那么应该是讲一些，呃，在这个这个村镇的污水处理行业，现在是一个很快的一个高速的一个，那么他们更多是绿，那么对于呃城镇来说，更多是能效的一个提升。那么最后呃，我会有张图来介绍一下，因为。第一场其实我看了有三家公司，都是在这个中国的这个就是我们的污水处理厂方面去提质增效方面，他们有很好的一些软件和工具。那么这块呃这一部分我就会简单的简单的这个概述一下。呃，好，这是一张这个我们中国在这个过去二十年我们气候变化的一个国际的一个目标。那么在这个去年的九月二十二号，可能大家最近这个特别是最近半年。在这个网上一直会有很多的消息，就是能看到中国，我们首次在这个联合国的这个气候变化大会上承诺，我们中国到二零三零年将实现这个碳的这个达峰，到二零六零年我们将实现碳的中和。那么，在这个非化石燃料的非化燃料的比例，我们到二零三零年将增加到百分之二十五。那么，我们在这个呃林木的碳汇的这个积蓄量方面，将增加到呃六十亿立方。那么，在我们的风电和水电的可可再生能源领域，我们将提升到这个每年的十二亿度电的一个这样的这个并网的这个绿色电量。呃，今年的一月五号也有一个非常大的一个政策的变化，就是说，呃，之前我们的气候变化是在我们的发改委、国家发改委。那么今年一月五号之后，我们的整个气候的这个减排的这一块的。计算和这个交易，还有我们未来的这个备案，都会在都会都已经转到了这个生态环境部来进行管理。那么，呃，就在几天前，武汉的这个全国的这个备案，这个碳交易的这个备案中心、碳交易中心已经已经正式的成立。那么再过几天，在上海的这个碳交易的这个中心也要成立。所以，呃。今年的这个 COP 二十六的会议上，联合国大会上，我们中国应该是会首次这个这个公布我们的 NDA， 就是我们国家的这个减排的这个数据。所以现在各个省市的这个碳中和的目标，还有达峰路线，还有这个路径，还有这个可再生能源的这些配额的这些比例、消纳的比例，都在紧锣密鼓的在在进行啊。所以我们也能看见这个发改委呃这个。呃，还有这个以前的那个能源局，也在这个新能源的方面也做了很多，这个呃更深的一些这个落地啊。呃，那么这个是现在最权威的一个公布的图，关于中国就是我们的一点五度的一个达峰的这个减排的这个路径。那么目前来说，到二二零二零年，呃，中国整个的这个排放量大概是在一百。一吨当量，那么我们在这个如果要实现这个呃巴黎谈判里面的这个一点五度的话，那么我们在未来的这个四十年，就是从现在开始，未来四十年，每年我们将预计到会有这个一百一千三百八十，一千三百八十，一百三十八亿，一百一千三百八十亿的，一百三十八个车联的一个这样的投资，相当于我们中国整个 GDP 的百分之二点五。所以这个将是一个非常好的，对于这个减排行业，对于这个低碳行，就是对这个能效减排行业是非常好的一个利好消息。那么同时也是，呃，今年我们跟这个欧盟签的这个绿色的这个协议里面也是承诺
这个中国在呃，我们这个到二零三零年，整个中国减排会让减排的这个强度会在百分之五十到五十五啊，这也是个非常 aggressive 的一个一个目标啊。那么看一下，在这个未来的四十年里面，我们大概的这个钱，这个呃每年的这个投资的一千三百八十亿会去到哪些板块？那么这个也是这个清华大学、清华呃河南研究研研究所、啊，还有这个落基山等等这些智库，他们给出的一个比较官方的一个数据，就是我们这个整个七十个缺点会去到呃七个板块。那么跟我们今天这个污水之路的这个污水的水水污板块里面，大概能占到我们整个的这个减排的百分之呃十二啊，还是比较高的。这个理念跟我们整个污水厂，中国目前在建的这个呃，差不多有一万出头的污水厂，呃，以一万吨到五万吨规模为多的这样的污水处理规模，将会有百分之七十以上污水厂都面临到一个提升，就是这个能效提升的一个这样的减排的一个，呃，一个是刚性需求，还有一个是国家的一个政策的一个导向。那这个、这个方面也是会有很多的这种。呃呃，这个这种智能智能的这种技术，还有运营的一些这种手段，啊，还有像这个在呃污水厂里面，我们把这个呃沼气能源和污水里面的这个沼气、污水污泥里面的沼气提纯出来，然后进行能源的那个再利用，就是刚刚也说到了，就是 water energy 水能的一个这样再利用、再利用的一个提升，啊，因为这个里面有很多是属于我们叫 low hanging fruits。就是现在我也是扔掉了污污泥中这个能源全部扔掉了，但是，呃，当我们有这个碳减排的这个这个呃双碳目标达峰的时候，大家就会在这方面呃投入更多的这个精力和目标。呃，那么看一下，在这个水的行业、污水行业里面，我们怎么去计算我们的碳这个我们的碳足迹？呃，我们的碳足迹的计算方法是基于这个 RWI 在二零一一年公布的。关于这个整个全球的城镇化的这个减排的方法，那么现在中国也有我们对应的团标在进行开发。那么我们的那个整个的污水的排放大概是分成七个板块，我们的这个污水的管网，从我们的污水厂的本身，从我们的这个污泥的这个处置，还有从我们的还有呃没有处理的污泥和污水这五个方这五个单元都有直接的碳排放。那么在这个污水环保的配置和污水处理的比，和我们的污水的比，这都会产生这个间接的排放。所以，呃，我们要算一下我们污水行业的碳足迹的话，那不是五个直接排放加直接排放加。那么我们看一下，呃，我们在这个二零一五年我们得到的这个数据里面，我们看一下。中国我们按照五个区域来分，因为，呃，屁股盖不一样，所以我们的污污污污泥处理的五个呃呃技术路线，还有这个污水厂的处理技术路线都不太一样。我们的海线差不多，南方来看，呃，这个碳排放是最低的，在零点五五公斤的碳排放量每 cubic。那么，北方其实北京华北地区是最高的。是在一公斤二氧化碳每吨所以这个原因是因为南方气候比较温暖，它不需要去。是这个整本身这个气候也比较稳定，所以它整个部分中，呃，江苏啊、重庆啊，还有北啊，会发生很多。那北方还有很多这个管网啊，也还比一些核污水可能过在一起啊，所以这是。原因我们发现的，那我们再看一下这个，反过来我们来算我们的量，那么我们也发现一些很有意思的数据，在中国的过去的二零一五到二零二零年，和我们的这个城镇的污水处理量以及对应的这个碳排放量，呃，我们当时就是我们每平每每吨污污水或者发现。它的那个电耗量，那么，呃，每吨这个电耗量是不断的在增长。这个原因是有两个，因为我们污水的排放这个标准
分提高，从这个 D D 现在到 E A， 然后到现在到。越来越高，所以处理的功率越来越复杂，这个电耗越来越高。另外部分就是我们也能看见我们整个的基本的这个处理的这个规模也也在增加，因为它也是非常非常快。特别我们看见从一九到一九年，每年的这个污水由于城市的污水比例而碳排放比例是百分之五十。从一零七年的八点四，到现在最新的是五十五千四百五千四百五千五千四百多人氧化碳排量，那增长速度百分之五十，这个也是非常非常大的一个排放。那么我们再看一下我们的这个污水的这个组成，刚刚我也说了，就是北方南方。是差别比较大。第二个就是说，我们的气候带也差别比较大。那么污水里面其实有大量的能能量。那么因为而且本身在污泥里面也有大量的这个这个能源，你现在用。右边那张图你能看见的有一个城镇污水厂里面，左边是干水的产生，右边是干水的这个这个处理。像现在来说，就是简单的一个干化，可能就是露天干化。要做很多的一些这个高级的那么，呃，上一场的那两家公司，就是从呃从这样子讲，他们一般分几个路径，一个就是说整个一氧发酵发酵，这个是一个一个路径。第二第二个就是说一氧发酵产氢，这个路径，一氧化碳减排，三个非常现在是在做比较多的路径。那么在这方面呢，我们能提供很多不同场的这个，因为就是比如说百分之五十的基础，这个三百零五，但是我们不能提供太多。所以，呃，如果一旦我们把我们的工厂的污泥，呃，传统工厂的污泥，我们进行这个这个消费的这个提升，那么我们可以实现，以实现污水厂本身的能源的自己，啊，这个是已经。这个是我们厂可以一个一个变厂的一个变成一个产能的一个，可以大大减少这个碳的排放，同时也。这、呃、然后我们看一下现在，就是说从在过去十年也有一些很有意思的数据，就是说，呃，这个上面这个。蓝色的这个这个蓝色，是我们在这个呃给水的这个投资；深色的蓝色是我们在这个污水的这个投资。呃呃，我们发现一些很有意思现象，就是中国的这个水务投资跟我们国家的这个大的这个水的水大的这个水的这个呃政策是息息相关的。我们能看见今年的这个将近四万亿出来。所以我们的这个污水的这个固体投资非常高的一个提升，然后到一五年我们中国的水是调出来，然后到我们的十三亿规划里面，城镇化的这个污水处理率也是挺大的提升，最后是到我们现在的这个三年的时间计划，那里我也能看见我们的这个污水的方面的这个投资是非常大的一个变化，所以我们能看见。也需要非常强的一个政策的引导，所以我们也希望我们能够引导到这个部里面，能够给这些减排的一些好的一些，或者任何一些这种这种呃鼓励的一些政策啊，来来扶持这个提升。呃，那么这个也是我们开辟一个计算过程，就是我们分析了中国的这个差不多到二零二零年一月份，中国目前我们。有一万零一百一十三个污水厂，他们是拿到的，全部的成本是，我们是基于所有这一万个出口的污水厂，他们的处理量、他们的处理目的、他们的处理路线、他们的这个气候带，啊，我们进行了一个一个一个计算，我们算到我们整个这个按照不同这种区域，我们的这个耗能的水平在什么位置啊？基于这个计算，我们算出来，目前到
去年呃的那个水污水行业的这个碳排放，应该是在那个五十四个 million， 差不多在五千四百吨二氧化碳当量。然后根据我们现在这个大家看这个碳排放的一个要求，碳指标的一个要求，我们到三十年到二零四零年之间，我们估计实现百分之五十到五十五的一个碳的一个降低。然后到二零五零年，我们百分之七十五的碳的排放降低。然后最后的十年，我们可能会通过一些碳中和，像我们最好的这个碳中和。好，这个。非常非常有深度的一个目标。我这么说呢，就是说，我们看现实数据，它并不是并不是这样走。在这个一八年之后，这个村镇的污水行，村镇的这个污水厂欣欣向荣，每年以十六的速度在增长。那么，我们过去大家还记不记得刚刚那个零七年到？就城镇污水每年增加百分之五十碳排放，就我们也能看见类似的趋势，就是村镇污水厂的这个对于建设村镇污水厂的这个污水设施,施而带来的碳排放也会非常高的比例。我们的碳中和制度还是比较比较这个有挑战性啊，所以呃。目前为止，这个村镇污水厂的整个的这个处理规模才差不多是呃千七百八十八万方八八万立方米。如果根据我们现在的这个整个乡村、乡村振兴，然后呃城市到这个农村，这么多人的这个工作问题，那可能这个数还要翻三倍啊。那对，那最后就是说一下，就是，呃，这个整个的这个趋势，因为这里面技术部门目前的公司都说了，那么，呃，随着这个深圳人口的这个增长和回流，呃，城镇市场的这个处理的品质越来越提高，我们认为，工业这个板块是要是太多。高比例的一个这个呃这个污泥的一个高比例的一个回用，并且污泥要变成能源，它不能去消化一下就就啊，它一定要变成能源，这个才是帮我们中国这个碳中和这个非常重要的一个路径啊。Um, thank you very much, uh, Jingjing, for your interesting sharing. Um, we'll later invite you back for uh, Q&A and panel discussions. Um, now I'll pass the microphone to our second speaker of today, the IP advisor of uh, China IP SME Help Desk, uh, Mr. Matthias Vimen. Matthias, all yours. Thank you, Welcome, everyone. My name is Matthias from the China IP SME Help Desk. I'm here to introduce what we do our services and also to discuss, to discuss a bit about IT protection. But first, let's talk about the current desk itself. We provide a teaching, training, education about intellectual property rights in China. We have an inquiry line which you and Costa Rican companies, SMEs, can write to us with any inquiry related with how to protect IP. We also provide trainings, workshops, webinars. In our website, you can find self-learning materials such as guides, fact sheets, and case studies. We are here to, to help, so feel free to contact us at, at any moment. But let's discuss about how to choose the best way of, of protecting uh, your IP here in China. There are several uh, types of IP that companies should take into consideration when deciding to, to protect what they do. Uh, here, I highlighted four of the main IP rights. The first one is invention patents, that they protect products and processes. Uh, by that, what is protected is the technology behind the product in the way that the product itself in the final version is protected, but also industrial processes such as manufacture that can be protected with invention patents. There's another way of protecting products 
which is utility models, utility models do not protect processes, despite the fact that here we can read that process are listed. They only protect the technology in both in the way that the product looks like if the product is presented. We also have design patterns, which only protects the ornamental and aesthetic aspects of the product, how it looks, how it is presented. And also we have trade secrets, uh, which is the type of IP that normally is forgotten because it's not been registered. Uh, it is protected as long as the company can keep certain knowledge that has commercial value. They can keep it as a secret, it will be protected. But once it is known by a competitor, there's no way to keep any type of protection. So the main question for companies are normally, should I register on my IP? Should I go with an invention pattern or should I keep it as a trade secret? And a way of answering this question can be seen with the case study. It was an Italian water filter company that they developed a new product and they were asking these same questions. Do I go with a patent or do I keep it as a secret? And to give an answer, the best way is to analyze different factors. This company analyzed their own product and they reached the conclusion that first, reverse engineering was not possible to be done because it was impossible to dismantle the final product, it was impossible to dismantle the different parts. So there was no way that the competitors could get the product, dismantling, who will present in it and then how it works. They also consider the cost of registration. They, if they go with the, with the mentioned patents, they have to pay their fees, the annual the registration fees, the annual fees for keeping the patent alive. Also, they thought about the cost of enforcement. If they find a copycat, they will have to sue them. And for that, you have to pay lawyers. That involves the extra costs. That can companies go and face this type of cost. And the final factor they analyze is the life, is the equation between protection and the technology life cycle. This product was expected to have a short period of time. So the, the life expectancy of the technology was quite short. By the time the technology was going to be, sorry, the, the product was going to be protected with the patent, the technology would be obsolete. So, the company uh, analyzes all these factors and make a final conclusion. Since technology, uh, sorry, since, since reverse engineering was not going to be possible, since litigation was going to be expensive and the protection of the patent will be obtained when the technology is obtained, they decided to keep it as a, as a trade secret. And also there is one uh, aspect of IP that normally technology companies tend to forget, that is the commercial and marketing aspect of IP, trademarks. Trademarks quoting is a thing here, sadly, still going on, and companies should, should take into consideration and should pay attention to trademark protection. Trademark protection means protecting your company name, your product name, but also any other sign, any other a characteristic that you may think that is useful for the technical product from the ones of your competitors, then they should be protected as a, as a trademark. This trademark protection can be started in China, of course, directly with the China National Intellectual Property Administration, but also can be started in Europe thanks to the market system, the market system in which mainland China is part of. Uh, we normally advise companies that are so we're here to do a trademark translation. This means to translate the trademark into Chinese characters. This translation can be done in two different ways. The first one is phonetical, just replicating the sound, of the pronunciation of the international brand using Chinese characters, but also to be conceptual. If your trademark has a meaning, simply translating it into, into Chinese characters. Here you can see um, our social media, our which account you can scan the QR code and follow us. Um, oops, that's the end of my presentation. Sorry, I, there we go. Um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you um, again, Matthias, um, for your sharing. Um, and now we're moving on to our uh, next speaker. 
uh, Mr. Uh, Donut Dealing from Arvia, who will share uh, with us, uh, first of all, the experience uh, of uh, Arvia uh, as a UK company um, being operate, uh, operating in China, but also his uh, views eventually um, on how um, the solutions are connecting with the circular economy, how to address the missing link. Uh, without further ado, um, let's invite uh, Donuts to the stage. Uh, thank you, Liam, and thank you, uh, EU SME, for this invitation, uh, for myself being here to share my opinion and also experience with you, with you all. Uh, the PPT seems to be a little off. Uh, sorry, we'll uh, have some technical uh, issues. Um, maybe, uh, Donut, you can already start um, by introducing technologies. At the same time, our colleagues will be uh, swapping the presentations. Okay. For this, for that. No problem. Okay, so just a, a very brief introduction about uh, our company and our technology. And uh, so we, I'm sharing the opinions from uh, perspective of a technical company. Um, and I am really grateful to, to uh, hear all the opinions shared in, the, in this uh, first section and also the, the opinion shared by uh, Jing Jing and uh, the overview of the policy in the, I think, circul circular economics in the water sector. And uh, we are, okay, we are a company um, uh, specialized in the electrical oxidation process and uh, and uh, our objective and all, all say our motivation uh, to create this uh, uh, technology is um, also meeting with this like uh, circular uh, economy in the water sector. Because in, uh, as you introduced uh, previously, in most of the WWTD wastewater treatment plants, um, a lot of the equipment and technologies and uh, it consumes a lot of energy in order to meet with the uh, I think more strict uh, water discharge regulation, and um, okay. So the PPT is still not okay. Um, yeah. And uh, just about the background of our company. So we our headquarters is in UK, and uh, we start to uh, we started to doing business in China since 2017. And uh, our first pro scale commercial um, project in the Chinese wastewater treatment is in is for the one of the uh, largest uh, petrochemical company in Sinopec in Nanjing City. Um, okay, so I will just continue our PPT presentation, even though it's not on the screen right now. Um, our business sector uh, in, in the China in the China market covers pharmaceutical, chemical, utilities, uh, food and beverage, petrochemical, oil and gas, and all other. Uh, most of the major industrial wastewater uh, sectors. And uh, our technology, uh, the principle of our technology is uh, electro-oxidation, but we are um, uh, one of the earliest uh, companies who uh, integrated the, uh, the electro-oxidation with absorption uh, process. So talking about absorption uh, technology, you will always think about GAC. We are kind of putting a uh, granular uh, carbon particles inside our reactor to create a, a 3D or multi-dimensional uh, reactor to, to use electricity to directly oxidize all the organic uh, pollutions. So through this path, we can uh, reduce the energy consumption uh, in this COD reduction process. Um, uh, too bad we are. <laughs> 
not showing this, uh, the, 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 the contents. Okay, yeah. Okay. No, no, it's better. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so uh, we have covered a lot of the sectors in all uh, wastewater type in, in China uh, industrial market. So our main target would be, well, some of the most difficult uh, problems that we have seen in the uh, Chinese industrial wastewater treatment sector. Like for example, uh, there are several of those like type of wastewater, they have really low biodegradability and also they have high source, high color, and high toxicity. That is difficult to be treated by a conventional bioprocess or the conventional um, uh, advanced oxidation. So we are providing a new uh, solution to, 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 the, to this market and uh, uh, with all the, I mean, technical development and also uh, our application in the industry, we have gained, well, Acquire some, uh, for example, the awards, and also in China and also in the Europe. So this is uh, the these are the major areas that uh, we use our technology in this uh, uh, China market. Uh, for example, the recalcitrin COD is the most uh, I think uh, constant uh, constant focus um, uh, area. We and we are aiming to uh, get to the. I think the latest uh, COD uh, discharge limit, for example, the below 50 and below 30 microgram per liter of uh, level. And uh, in in the Western countries, we are uh, uh, most of our, our applications are focusing on the microgluten and uh, SE, uh, SECs. Um, okay, coming back to the circular economy. So. Uh, regarding to this concept, and uh, is the, the, the idea from the technical perspective is how you can use your technology to put to be putting in the right step of the whole treatment train. So actually, we considering different approach, and uh, we are we are applying our technology in different steps so that we can reduce the overall energy consumption and also to uh, optimize the, the, the efficiency and uh, also the uh, um, pollution removal rate uh, in different stage of the uh, treatment train. And uh, this is just a brief uh, comparison with the other tertiary uh, technologies and uh, in the conventional center uh, I mean, uh, markets. So, okay. Uh, so after the introduction of our company and also technologies, so here is our, uh, my, personal and our company's experience and uh, in this um, uh, China water treatment sector uh, in terms of the circular economy uh, concept. So um, I think uh, Jing Jing has given a very detailed and thorough uh, overview on the policy and also the, the current uh, status of the, uh, this uh, uh, circular economy in the wastewater treatment sector. And uh, I think the point I want to uh, address is just uh, because we are trading wastewater, but um, in this concept, we are trying, I think for the next step, uh, we are trying to uh, put the uh, waste into resources. And uh, this is also our technical, uh, our, uh, us technical companies are trying to do, and is reduce the energy consumption and uh, to try to convert the waste in all those wastewater into the, the resources that we can reuse. And uh, it, the, the, the things we can reuse can be coming from the purified water and also all the salt in, in the wastewater. Um, uh, looking back into the, I think the, the background or history and uh, from 2016 and uh, NACO and EvoLab have already formed a strategy with strategic partner with uh, Microsoft so that they can better to monitor monitor and also regulate uh, the entire operation of the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, later on, there are more, uh, I think China is growing uh, the regulation and policies, which are very similar to the Western country like US and, 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 and UK and all the European countries. Um, And 
and this is a book. They are concentrate all the valuable resources from the waste streams. And uh, later on, there are more and more. I think in the recent years, there are more, more and more patents and new technology. Uh, they are uh, focusing to also the same concept to generate waste from the wastewater. Um, this is an overview of the, I think globally, all the uh, increasing capital investing into this uh, wastewater um, technology so that it can be uh, cost saving and also time saving. And under the current status of the COVID-19 outbreak, and uh, for example, the water intense pharmaceutical manufacturing sector, they are even growing faster and, and putting more, uh, I mean, investment and also uh, it also in their R&D effort to um, grow the needs and also to embrace more uh, high tech to, into their wastewater treatment plant. Uh, these are the major uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies that uh, they, they have their own storage uh, area so that uh, they are meeting with this like, um, circular uh, economic concept. And we can see uh, we are working, oh, we are also working with a few of these uh, uh, major pharmaceutical uh, companies like Merck and uh, also Adama in, in our China market. Um, so next slide is just about um, the, in the most recent months, and there are more and more uh, technical patents uh, given uh, published uh, to, to, for example, from the wastewater treatment method and also the material uh, so that it can be used more efficiently and also increase overall um, energy consumption in the wastewater treatment plant. Okay, uh, so coming back to our, I think, our experience in, in, in the China market, here I will just uh, 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 give a quick overview. And uh, basically we are, the clients that we are talking to, their main goal right now, and even uh, I think uh, one, they are more and more um, focused, even this year after the, the, the new policy that's given now is about the, the, the two carbon uh, objective, carbon neutral and carbon uh, reduce the carbon emission. So the energy, the energy per cubic meter of wastewater to be treated uh, is uh, gaining more and more traction uh, in, in, in the um, technical uh, selection uh, process. So right now we are trying to uh, reduce the uh, unit cost, unit energy consumption for, uh, for the water to be treated. And, uh, and the, in the meantime, they are also meeting with us more and more strict, uh, stricter and stricter regulation in terms of the water COD discharge. So we can see from the farm, uh, I mean, petrochemical uh, sector, they are getting down the COD to below 50 and even below uh, 20 and 30. And these are the petrochemical and coal chemical wastewater sector. They are also having the similar uh, targets in terms of the energy consumption and COD discharge. And so as the cooking wastewater, pesticide wastewater, uh, pharmaceutical wastewater. And um, one of the, I think uh, the referencing case I want to point out is about the Lampulice. Right now Lampulice is, I think is the most complicated um, uh, wastewater type to be treated by or a standard chain of uh, technology, or uh, we can say there's not a, uh, one solution can solve all the problems in Lambu Liche. So right now, one of our approaches, we are working with one of the major uh, EBC company in the Lambu Liche um, sector. Uh, we are trying to create a solution together so that we can, uh, well, putting, one, putting our technology in uh, one of the steps and optimize the overall treatment solution. And these are the groundwater, seawater, or the surface water they are also right now trying to pay more attention to the uh, specific compound in the in the, in the uh, water body, just like um, uh, the other regulations in the in U.S. and also European countries. And uh, these are about the drinking waters. Okay, uh, here's uh, the end of my presentation. Any questions? Um, thank you very much, Donut, um, and uh, apologies again. For the technicality issues. Now I'd like to, I would like to invite uh, all our speakers um, back on the stage. For uh, a 
panel discussion and question and answers. Um, okay, um, and I also would like to uh, remind our online participants, should you have any questions, um, please post them on the chat so that I could notify our speakers. Um, where can I see the questions? Um, okay. Uh, maybe some questions, first of all, from my side uh, to uh, Ching Ching and Donut. Um, because both of you in your presentation, you mentioned about um, this concept uh, moving from uh, wastewater treatment plants um, to um, water resource recovery factories, uh, which uh, um, um, uh, this is also one of the findings of uh, the previous webinars that we organized. So, and this has not only been promoted uh, primarily in research and demonstration projects, but now also by some larger um, water companies. Um, what is your view on, on this change of concept? Uh, what do you see the future outlooks of this change? Okay, um, I think uh, right now, based on this uh, circular economic concept and more and more, um, EPC company, engineering company, and also end users, they are paying more attention to the quality of the technology and uh, overall uh, efficiency of their plants, not just uh, solving the, previously, uh, people maybe just uh, thinking about solving the problem that the regulator have pushed up, have pointed out, but right now more and more the, uh, I think especially the tier one companies, they are uh, showing uh, the plans and based on the more sustainable uh, development plan. Uh, I think this circular economy is like a really like a, the different approach, holistic approach. The, not only the situation was in the plan, actually like also like cities and districts, they take a more holistic way to Calculate the, the the water energy resource. Previously, they just uh, they just uh, drop all the energy within the within the discharge. But now they will think, can I recover this energy from my discharge? Can I uh, reuse the, the 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 energy from the from the sludge? And in general, I think China don't don't lack technology, but lack the people who can provide this holistic uh, engineering. Solution, I think. Yeah. Thank you. In the meantime, uh, we also had a question from online um, to all the panelists. Um, access to all relevant water environment data uh, from different sources um, is very difficult. Um, and how much does this hamper realizing the potential of a circular economy approach? Uh, and um, what could be done to have um, such a platform for, uh, for all the data, uh, in your opinion? Uh, my opinion would be, um, I think that the, in, the wastewater, in the wastewater treatment sector or environmental sector, there's still um, uh, regulation driven. So I think, the, uh, I think China is doing a really great job at putting up more stricter and stricter regulation against uh, uh, pollution and also want to uh, reduce the carbon emission and in this uh, uh, circular economic concept and later on uh, the companies will invest more to on the overall monitoring and also to embrace more uh, high tech uh, high uh, high end technology to uh, for example do uh, more thorough and analytical of the water quality and also find the best solution to treat to solve all the uh, I mean most of the problem that we are facing.
the, the data for first one, I think in November when, when we publish our climate data to the UN, I think it will be much easier for the externals to get the transparent, more transparent the Chinese climate data within the eight sectors. So this, I think, will be in soon. They can get more data for China uh, and uh, for emissions of different sectors. Second one is that uh, when China is now uh, into the, 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 the track with the international climate uh, database, then for us, we, we can see uh, it's also like would be more potential for, for uh, European technology to be, to be as a playground in China. Yeah. Well, from IP protection point of view, uh, such data collection platforms um, is established by any European institutions. Anything you think, in your opinion, is accomplished? Uh, well, regarding IP protection, we always have to know that sensible information can be or should be protected as crazy. The company has any information that will provide a competitive advantage and it should be kept away from competitors, then they should be yeah, kept as a secret as long as possible. There are different techniques to do so. For example, not allowing the employees of the company to have access to them, letting only people who really know the, the information who perform their job duty to have access to that information. That's what I can say from the IP perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, as, and as uh, we are discussing already now about data collection platforms, uh, data management systems, um, there we can um, possi possibly bring the link from um, the topic of our previous discussion about digital economy, uh, about the digitalization, um, to find the link of uh, uh, digitalization, the use of uh, digitalization systems uh, with a circular economy. How do you think eventually um, the trends of uh, digitalization could um, influence the developments of uh, um, companies operating uh, towards the circular economy uh, directions. Um, what's your view on this? Data from the digitalization system and uh, to feedback to each of those uh, technology or process or equipment uh, that is planned. Okay, so um, yeah, the, the data will be very helpful to feedback to each technical provider and also the, the WWTT uh, management team. And this will help them to make a better decision from, uh, I think, overview uh, perspective to increase their efficiency and lower the, the overall OPEX. Uh, efficiency and quality driven is uh, a key implementation direction for 14 five year plan in China. Uh, and I can see already there are a lot of projects which is driving on this direction. And we can see the Chinese zero waste city program pilot uh, implementation projects. And also we can see a lot of uh, waste, uh, waste, waste recycling and also the waste, uh, you know, resorting the reuse and then the uh, going to different part of the uh, recycling components. So actually for us, we can already see actually early from this year, there are a lot of actions from the, from the, from the market. Yeah. The increase of, of efficiency is something that we can see not only in the water, I think it's a general tendency that it's happening in China. We can see it in the new technology, the increase of registration of patents, uh, equity models, and all kinds of technology. So I would say that in the future, this tendency is going just to continue growing. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I pick up the last point Matthias uh, has uh, mentioned. Um, circular economy also goes above, uh, goes beyond the boundaries. And actually, um, you can easily re relate 
uh, circular economy um, for cross sectors, for example, water, energy, um, um, and many different sectors that we could uh, think about. Um, and then how do you think, um, and also uh, as, as uh, Donald, you have mentioned uh, your systems, um, it's also a cost sector, uh, on a cost, a cost sector basis. So how do you think eventually circular economy can contribute to reduce the, the silos of uh, different sectors and eventually to create cost sector um, frameworks and synergies uh, for the further development of uh, circular economy uh, effect itself. Yeah, I think that's 100% uh, true that uh, this uh, circular economy concept should be across uh, different sectors because uh, not just only wastewater or water treatment and uh, for uh, each single plan, you have to consider the energy, the, the, the resources that you put into and uh, overall the, the, the treatment sector. For example, just a really simple uh, example is that uh, uh, right now people are using more uh, recorded uh, waste heat generated from either burning power or other uh, heat generated uh, equipment to feed those like waste heat into an evaporator. So, so at this at, at this point, that uh, you don't need to uh, put in extra energy or electricity to heat up the evaporator, but just use some uh, something you previously consider as waste, but right now you are using it to um, improve uh, to, to 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 feed to your new system and and improve the overall uh, resources usage. Uh, for our perspective, is we can see the the carbon tariff, the domestic uh, carbon trading mechanism, and then the the transaction systems will definitely boost the emission reductions uh, on the circular economy umbrella. Uh, like uh, Donna just said, that people will think this waste uh, surplus energy is that uh, waste or is that energy. So, and also like when people build uh, in the construction site, when they have put the climate target, they will think, should I use so much concrete? Should I use more wooden driven projects? Uh, should I consume less, you know, in boiled carbon? So I think, I think this, this is like different ways for people to, for developer, for contractor, for uh, operator to rethink about their existing uh, material flow. I think, yeah. The use of the technology in different sectors is something that companies should also take as an incentive for investing. Um, if you register the technology, you protect it, you have also the chance to license it to more competitors to obtain extra profit. Um, again, this should be seen as a business opportunity and a reason and an incentive to keep investing, keep researching, and keep improving the circular economy. Um, thank you all. Um, and we have one last question coming from online. Um, the Fordings Five-Year Plan that has boosted an increased focus on reuse of wastewater. Uh, but the fact is that um, the uh, um, yeah, the, the administration of water resource supply and wastewater treatment uh, is done by different organizations regulated by different ministries in China. So eventually, um, to your opinion, can this be done um, efficiently if the organizational structure is placed like this? Uh, I think, well, in a big country like China, everything has to be done uh, uh, step by step. So I think right now the well developed, well developed uh, zones like Shanghai, like the uh, Guangdong Triangle, uh, while they are better, I mean regulation and also the um, monitor across the different cities. So they are pushing all the end users and customers and even the uh, public to 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 exercise this uh, uh, policy and rules, and uh, I think eventually, and uh, this influence will be penetrated into other smaller cities and also less developed uh, cities area. Um, thank you, thank you very much.
um, again, um, everyone. Also, uh, I thank uh, all our participants joining us offline. Um, even if we did not uh, manage to get um, a big audience as uh, we have expected, however, luckily enough, we have uh, um, enough um, smart brains uh, for us to pick um, from all our uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, so again, I thank you very much for your sharing and insights. Um, and uh, as a normal practice, all the USC Center uh, seminars, webinars, we are going to record, and so this one has also been recorded, and we're going to upload it uh, online uh, for further distribution and also for uh, the outreach of bigger audience. Um, and I also take this last chance to remind uh, all the online participants uh, and also uh, everyone from offline to scan this QR. Uh, it takes a few minutes, uh, very short, uh, to fill in a questionnaire uh, where uh, we can collect feedback from, from you uh, for us to constantly improve uh, the performances of our, of our webinars. Um, that is the end of uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, thank you again for your attention. Thank you.